I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're listening to the only story that matters. This is true oral storytelling. I write every episode myself, and then, like the Scandinavian bards known as Scalds, I perform them in one single flawless take. This is the best episode yet, so feel free to start right here. Afterward, if you want to catch up, you can listen to previous episodes of the podcast for free, or buy the prose volumes on Amazon for only $2.99 each. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 58. He was once a runner. He was once a dreamer. He was once a creator. But now, now, he was something better. He was a proctor. Before, he had his individuality, that worthless prize that he had guarded so fiercely, so ferociously. But what had it ever gotten him? Where had it gotten him? Nothing, nowhere. Through hard work, through harder thought, through the hard lessons of the proctors, those sweet, caring, sacrificing proctors. Now, he had learned a better way. Now, he was no longer alone. He was no longer a sole individual swimming upstream. Now, he was part of a school, part of a pack, a group made strong by its numbers and by the bonds they shared, made strong not by what differentiated them, but from what they had in common. Knowledge of the truth acceptance of the world, the real world, and the long black cloaks were their sign of office. Finally, he had realized his potential. He had risen to his potential. He had become a good boy, and things had gone ever so well. They had been right. His father had been right. He was capable of so much more. He was meant for so much more. And now, finally, finally, he was achieving it. He was doing it. He was working for the betterment of himself, for the betterment of Ravana, and for the betterment of her people. He had been fortunate that his father had spotted his potential early, that he had been able to see that though his path would be a circuitous one, though he would struggle to remain focused, to retain his focus, that in the end, the struggle would be worthwhile. His father believed in his potential, and so the proctors did as well, standing by him when he couldn't even stand by himself when his mind had been willingly lost inside a shifting, meaningless world of his own creation, and because of their faith, because of their dedication, he had ascended. He had risen. He had ascended up the ladder. He had risen through Ravana society, from inmate to mason to orderly, and now, proudly, to procurer. He had been sent there, assigned to the stinking, steaming bowels of that great city, far beneath its bustling streets and its awe-inspiring factories. He had been sent to find others, to spot their potential, and most importantly, to help them realize it. So we marched through that stinging, Stinking heat, plodding his way amongst the workers and their wheelbarrows, doing his best to 
block out the infernal racket. The sighs and the moans, the cries and the curses, the pumping of arcane machinery, the rendering of ruined flesh, and the unintelligible roars of that monster, that heaving abomination, the one that was the source of all ravenous prosperity. The Titan. It was there, in that nightmarish purgatory, that he saw him. It was there, in the most unlikely of places, in the cavern meant for those who had nothing to offer, nothing to offer their city but what remained of their miserable lives. It was there, in that place, the one that he, he and the rest of the proctors thought to be utterly devoid of talent, devoid of potential. It was there that he saw something miraculous, something impressive, something awe-inspiring. Firing. A figure that even there, even in a convulsing pit of suffering and despair, still held himself with what could only be described as a regal bearing. The proctor first saw him from a distance, saw him as he filled his wheelbarrow with that steaming gruel, saw that even then, while performing the most debased and debasing work imaginable, he still held his head high. And the proctor, he was as stunned as he was impressed, as he was delighted, a reason for his presence in that terrible pit, someone to elevate, someone to help ascend, someone to save. At first, he thought it a trick of the light, thought it an optical illusion created by that potent mixture of shadows, steam, smoke, sweat, and suffering. But as the man as that noble figure approached, the proctor could tell that it was no illusion. It was no trick. The man, the one that oozed power and potential with every movement, no matter how simple, no matter how mean, he was covered from head to toe in soiled black rags. He was bound tightly, with only his eyes still visible, those eyes that burned with something dread and fearsome, something powerful, something wild, something that the proctor could not identify, but that he nonetheless coveted. He knew it was ridiculous, it was absurd, but he found himself feeling envious, feeling jealous of this noble, powerful figure, despite the fact that he was beneath him, despite the fact that he was working there, despite the fact that he had been all but condemned to death, despite the fact that his toil was no doubt made even more insufferable for being covered in that filthy fabric. He was bound as the savage desert tribes treated their dead. But though he was clearly savage, clearly wild, he was also very, very much alive. The workers scattered as he approached, fleeing the aura of fear that preceded his every step. But that fear he created, the awe he spread amongst his fellow workers, it only further intrigued the procurer. He turned and spoke to his fellow proctors, the ones assigned to him, ordered to help him pick out workers that were going to waste, to help him help them realize their potential. Quickly. He demanded to know more about that terrible, noble, bound figure. The one that so clearly stood out from the wretches surrounding him. The one that seemed to tower over his fellow workers, not so much in stature, but in presence. And the only response the proctors gave was a pained silence. Eventually, 
at their leader's prodding, at his commands, at his demands, a single proctor replied. He spoke what little he knew about the figure, explained that, yes, his potential was frightful and frightening, terrible and great and seemingly limitless. That potential was wrapped in something else. His vitality was fueled by something awful, something horrific, something monstrous, something that their society, their city, something that Ravenna could not abide. His potential laid not in growth, not in development, not in creation, but in destruction, in barbarism, in never-ending flames and ashes. They had kept him alive, yes, but only just barely, only after they had subdued Rejected him to their surgery, that grisly, gruesome theft, the one that left him bereft of passion, bereft of drive, bereft of that which defined and motivated him. Or at least, it should have. Proctor was stunned. He was amazed. He was astonished. This, this powerful, commanding figure, the one that emanated a king's presence even while here, even while shoveling slop, even while covered head to toe in rags that appeared crusted with filth and gore. This was after his surgery? This was after he had been lessened? The proctor began to shake with excitement, with anticipation. Think of what he could accomplish. Think of what he could do. Think of what Ravenna could do. If he had that regal, powerful figure by his side, if he could harness that unbelievable, limitless potential, he could accomplish anything. He could accomplish everything. He would begin as they had begun with him. Frequent anchor treatments, daily anchor treatments, at least daily. He felt a pang of shame as he realized that whatever had been sufficient for him would be far too little for one such as this, this bound colossus. No. Not daily anchor treatments, twice daily anchor treatments, hourly anchor treatments. He would wake the man from sleep every hour on the hour if necessary, because it was necessary. It was essential that he have this man, that he elevate him, that he help him, that he use him. Because this, this was his potential. This was his role. This was what he was meant for, what he had been selected and groomed for. He was not his father. He could not accomplish what he had. His skills, his talents lay elsewhere. They lay in identifying those wild, nigh uncontrollable talents in others. The talents that once controlled, once reigned in and harnessed, could remake the world itself. What purer expression of his talents than to find the person with the most potential, to find the stallion that could not be tamed, and then miraculously to break him, to strap that snorting, raging beast to the cart of progress and lead their city-state, lead glorious Ravenna into the future that they deserved, the future they all deserved, the future was inevitable. No, the other proctors were wrong. They were cowards. They were weak and fearful. And that is why he had been placed in charge of them. It is why he held the authority there. Why it was he that made the calls, that made the decisions, that chose who they would next elevate. 
choice had been made. The choice had been made from the second he saw that powerful figure, the one whose strength seemed to cause the light itself to cower in fear. A gleaming, joyous smile took root and grew upon the proctor's face. The first honest, kind smile to ever be seen inside that horrible place. The first smile that wasn't infested with sadism or irony. Look to the future, to the glorious future that he would build, using that hulking figure as his tool. Anchor would dull him. It would cow him. It had to. He was only human, wasn't he? Enough of the anchor could hold anyone, could drag anything down to the ground. And then, then he would elevate the brute. He would aid him. He would save him, just as the other proctors had helped him. They would begin with the walls. The proctor shivered thinking about the speed at which a man like that could build walls, could wall himself in, could wall his fellow inmates in. He would have the savage not just lay the bricks, but haul them as well. At first, hauling the mortar and the stone would seem no different to him than hauling that awful gruel. But that was only at first. Eventually, he would grow to appreciate his place, to appreciate his new role, to appreciate the wholesome food in his belly and the warming sunlight on his face, to appreciate that the work he did went to better not only the city, but himself as well. He would give this brutal bound monster, this forgotten, discarded creature, a reason for existing, a reason to work, a reason to struggle. He would provide the pressure that would transform that dirty, common coal into a diamond. He would break him, and he would rebuild him, and then that when the magic occurred. That is when he would mold this brute, this savage, this oaf, into something new, into something wonderful. He would start slowly. Naturally, he would employ the man as a handyman, an assistant, ready, willing, and able to perform whatever tasks might be required within his compound. But soon, as he proved himself, that oath would be elevated. Just like his father, he believed in rewarding loyalty as well as potential. If the brute stayed true, if he did as was required, the procurer would help him climb the ranks, would help him ascend through ravenous society, would help that savage as the proctors had helped him, and the results would be wonderful. From worker to handyman, from handyman to assistant, from assistant to guard, from guard to warrior, from warrior to captain to general to... Who knew? Who knew how far this brute would rise? One with this much potential. One that elicited fear and awe in equal measure. One that stalked the earth with purpose even when his life was so clearly devoid of it. What couldn't this savage accomplish? What couldn't this brute do? What couldn't the proctor do with that oaf in his thrall? Rushing off their objections, ignoring their pleas, scoffing at their fears, he reiterated to the proctors that this, this, was the one, 
This was exactly why they had descended into the pit. This was the exact reason that he had been sent there. That oaf, the one covered in those filthy rags, possessed more potential than the lot of them combined, and he, the procurer, would see him ascend. He sent two of the proctors ahead sent them to prepare the brute, to explain to him just how lucky, just how fortunate he truly was, to explain that his life, for the first time ever, would finally, finally have meaning as he was given an opportunity to contribute, to contribute meaningfully, to give something to the city, to give something to Ravenna, and, just as importantly, to give something to himself. They would use the script that the proctors always did when identifying potential. They would first explain how utterly special, how utterly unique the selected was, a tactic meant to prime them, to prepare them to be agreeable, complacent. They were words that they always spoke that they always used, and they were always effective. But this time, this time, they were truthful as well. Slowly, he followed behind. He would watch from a distance, and then, when the time was right, when it was his turn in the script, when the proctors had conveyed to the brute just how lucky he was, just how fortunate to have been selected, he would approach, slowly, wearing the prescribed smile, one that always served to put the selected at ease, one that was always effective, and one this time, was truthful as well. The proctor, the procurer, was overjoyed. He was thrilled by his find, and even more thrilled at what the future, what their future, would hold. What he would accomplish, what he would be, how he would change the world and make it his own, how he could make this real world like the world he wished to know, like the world he had known, like the world he had created, like the world of his dreams. No, no, these weren't visions of greatness. They were delusions, delusions of grandeur. He shook his head suddenly and violently, drawing the concerned attention of the proctors that still remained by his side. Even in the face of such spectacular, such truly amazing developments, he must remain steadfast. He must keep his feet planted firmly upon the ground, upon the rigid foundations of the real world. Clenching his eyes shut, Pinching the bridge of his nose, he gestured at the proctor to his left. He gave a silent, wordless signal that the proctor was well familiar with, one to which she knew exactly how to respond. But with the utmost care and concern, wanting only what was best for the procurer, she reached into her robes and removed the implements he desired, the implements he required. A mortar, a pestle, and a small pouch of that divine salve of the mind, of the crutch that eases the wise man's burden. The anchor. She worked quickly knowing that the timing of the script was of the utmost importance. She deposited a pile of those precious herbs into the mortar. She ground them with the pestle, displaying a deafness and an alacrity that was belied by her grim demeanor. And then, quickly, expediently, she lit the contents of the mortar with a single match and held it up under the procurer's nose. 
He didn't need to open his eyes to know that it was there. He could feel its presence, warm, inviting, nourishing. He knew that the anchor was there, waiting for him, holding him down, protecting him from the capricious winds and whims of his imagination, just as it always did. Smiling, he breathed in. He breathed in deeply through his nose, letting the fragrant smoke drift up into his nostrils, allowing it to wind through his nasal cavities, and then, finally, slowly, to settle down into his waiting lungs. There, he held it in for as long as he could, separating himself from his distractions, focusing only on the smoke, only on the anchor and the relief it bestowed upon him, on the sweet bondage that it provided. He meditated on how it warmed, protected, and comforted him like the swaddling of a newborn child. And then, finally, after a momentary eternity spent as one with those precious herbs, he released the smoke with a sigh. But he didn't blow out. No, that smoke was far too precious to expel in a rush, too wondrous to waste. Instead, he simply opened his mouth allowing the smoke to escape, now visibly lighter, having been relieved of its most potent essence. He let the smoke rise slowly, framing a peaceful expression on his face, still allowing the anchor to escape at its own speed, on its own accord. He opened his eyes and saw with great pleasure that the proctors continued to move through the script. He smiled and began walking again, slightly faster now to make up for the time lost with the anchor. And as he waddled forward, propelling his prodigious bulk upon those thick, bloated, artless legs, a thin, light stream of anchor smoke trailing behind him, he watched as the proctors did just as they were supposed to, watched as they reached up and undid the chains upon the bound brute's neck. But suddenly, his harmony was disturbed, was ruined, was wrecked, overturned, and demolished because something happened that was not part of the script, that was not part of any script, the brute, the savage, the oaf, his expression was still hidden by those filthy, soiled rags. But now the procurer was close enough to see the man's eyes clearly. And as the figure struck out with his chains, the procurer saw exactly what those hateful eyes held. Flames and ashes. The figure struck the proctors down, but his aim was not to kill them. No, he clearly had other designs. He had other plans. He struck them down, but instead of delivering the death blow, he did something far, far more terrible. He reached up and he tore away his bandages. As awful as they were, as disgusting and deplorable as those filthy rags had been, what they hid was far, far worse. Etched into his skin, colored an unnatural woad blue, were sigils and runes, a script that the procurer had never seen outside of his dreams, a language lost, relearned, and forgotten again before the worlds were sundered, the words of a terrible spell that stopped the procurer in his tracks, that made him cough out what was left of the anchor, that made his lungs spasm in fear, and made his heart beat a primal, atavistic rhythm that no man should ever hear. The 
brute. Freed from his chains, freed from his bandages, lunged forward, seeking out his true objective. The other workers scattered, as terrified as the procurer was, and though the other proctors attempted to stop him, their efforts were half-hearted and craven, as none truly wished to place hands upon that rampaging oaf, the one barreling forward at a frightful pace, knocking aside anyone too slow or too foolish to get out of his way. At first, the procurer... Like the rest of the proctors, he had assumed that the savage's goal was freedom, that his objective was escape. But shockingly, the brute charged not toward the exits that dotted the edges of the cavern, but instead toward that stinking, steaming pit's very center. Slowly, eventually... A terrible realization dawned upon the procurer. He understood, he knew, and his soul quaked in unspeakable horror because all he could do was stand motionless, speechless, dumbfounded as he watched that tattooed brute, that savage king, as he watched the one true king of flames and ashes reach out to the titan, the one who stared ahead expectantly with retribution, with vengeance in its eyes, as he watched King Maul take the monster's collar in his massive, powerful, tattooed, calloused hands and shatter it. I hope you're digging Scald. No, I know you're digging Scald. So please, help the only story that matters by reviewing the show on iTunes. And if you leave a good one, I'll read it right here. Kelly Hoffert wrote this. Scald is the spoken word equivalent of an Amina Marth record. Epic, engaging, infectious, and most of all, Metal. Scald is a throwback to an old concept, a single storyteller entertaining his audience with the spoken word. But the way that Scald is supported, the way I keep it going, that's also an old concept. Patronage. And right now, you have a chance to become the Jarl to my Scald, the Medici to my Leonardo da Vinci. You can become an integral part of the only story that matters. And all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash scald today and sign up to support the show. It's safe, secure, and easy. Please talk about Scald on social media and make sure to tag me so I can share your posts. I'm Aubrey Sitterson on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat. And I am shameless. I share all compliments and all positive reviews. You can also hit up AubreySitterson.com for links to everything, including Scald, my wrestling talk show Straight Shoot, my comics work, bio, contact information, and more. Earlier, Kelly Hoffert compared Scald to one of my favorite bands, Viking metal gods, Ammon Amarth. So, it's fitting then that this week's recommendation is Ammon Amarth's newest album, Yom's Viking. Like all of Ammon Amarth's work, it's a melodic death metal take on Viking themes of war, battle, and conquest. One that never, ever, ever veers into power metal cheese. They didn't reinvent the wheel here because they didn't need to. Ammon and Marth know exactly who they are. They lean into it, and they absolutely rip. If you've dug their other records, you're gonna dig this one. And if you've never given them a listen, this is a great place to start. Yom's Viking. It's on Spotify, it's on iTunes, it's everywhere. Listen to it. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.